So what do you need first? A LED, for example, where you put on the multi electro array or microwires. Then you need, you have to insert the microwires into the brain, but then you need a micro drive, for example, or a stereoductive pointer to position the electrode exactly. Then you connect it to a head stage preamplifier, which is as close as possible to the microwires to change the impedance and to drive the cable, which goes to the main amplifier. And you have to fix the head stage on the head of the head. Normally you do it with some dental cement. And yeah, then the head stage amplifier is connected to a main amplification unit, which is doing the high sampling, which is for example 40 kilohertz. And you need also a tracking system to know where the head is located in space. So in this case, we use a video tracking system to get the X and Y position into the computer together with the spikes. And here we run the real-time analysis software to visualize and analyze the data. On this picture, you see a stainless steel tube with the microwires inside. So basically, you take these microwires, you twist them, the microwires are isolated, and you just cut the tip of the microwires to have open ends of your wires. And these wires are inserted into the brain. Here you see a stereoductive pointer for positioning them. So first, of course, you have to drill a, a hole, and afterwards you can insert the microwires. Here's a picture of a silicon electrode produced by Yossi Shaham from Tel Aviv University and Lund University from Sweden. It's a 10-channel electrode. So the electrode pins are on the tip of this electrode, and you can see the layout here. And the inter-electrode distance in this case is only 20 micrometers, so it's very small. It can also easily break down. So yesterday somebody, somebody was already breaking one of these electrodes, but I pass it also around and have a look. And the biggest problem of such small ele electrodes is of course the interfacing. So in this case we use a zero force Rolex connector to interface to the we can also get the uh, dead code from Tom's recording, which is shown here. So basically it has four contacts and they are embedded in class to have a very good isolation. And the advantage of this dead code is that the electrodes are exactly at the defined position. So you know the distance from the electrode pins to each other. So for holding the, the microwires and dead codes in position, you, you can use a micro like shown here. So first you drill the hole where the microwires should be inserted. Then you place the micro drive onto the skull and connect the, the microwires to the head stage amplifier. And here you see a little screw that can be used to lower down the electrodes, the microwires into the plane. So every day you can turn a few times, you lower it down and you try to find your place in it. Then the head stage is connected to a head stage, uh, the microwires are connected to a head stage amplifier, like shown here. So there are several operational amplifiers included. In this case, it's a 16 channel unit. It has 23 by 23 millimeters, weights less than 2 grams. So it's important that uh, the weight is not too high, otherwise, the, the head has problems moving around. And then you can connect it to a cable and to the main amplification unit. So I already explained to you that you can have different types of electrodes and you need a head stage, but now you have the problem of the interfacing of the different electrodes to the head stage. For that we use aggregation boards. So you can wire and solder all the different electrodes to the aggregation board and you can plug in the head stage. Here you see a picture of such, such an aggregation board. So the small silicon electrode goes in here into this uh, Molex connector. Then you have the wires to the application PCB itself. And onto this sample connector you plug in the head stage amplifier. And you see there are just a few centimeters between the micro wires and the head stage, which is important so that you don't pick up noise. And you see also some little golden pins here. They can be used, for example, for EMG recordings, but also for stimulation. So you can connect an electrical stimulator if you want to stimulate brain regions. Yeah, 
then we have to build the main biosignal amplifier. And as you see, we do that quite fast. And we designed here a biosignal amplifier that can all do all the different signals. So you can do EEG, you can do ECOG and spikes, and all at the same time, so you can nicely compare the different signals. So important about the amplifier is it's a 16-channel unit, it's 24-bit. So the 24-bit ADC allow you to go down with the resolution in the nanovolt range. And combined with an input sensitivity of plus minus 200 millivolts, it, you don't have to change the amplification of the amplifier. So you can connect all the different signals to the amp and you can already sample the data and you will never have a saturation effect of the amplifier. Important is also it includes a digital signal processor which is doing the oversampling. This means we are uh, driving the ADC of each channel uh, much too fast with 2.4 megahertz. And then we take 20,000 samples, we average all the 20,000 to get samples together to have just one sample, and this reduces the noise a lot. So the noise or the signal to noise ratio is improved because of the oversampling by a factor of 138, which is very effective. And George Wojciman told me on Friday that at the University of Washington they did recently a gamma recording, a EEG recording with our active electrodes and this amplifier up to several hundred hertz. Because of this oversampling technique, you can still measure this gamma activity, which is well below one microvolt. It's very small in this frequency range. And for the amplifier, we provide also different software programming <coughs> environments. So the most flexible one, but also the most difficult one, is the C++ application programming interface, which allows you to interface the amplifier directly from your software. This is used, for example, in BCI 2000. Um, for the interfacing, then you can also use MATLAB. This is much faster and easier, but of course you need MATLAB. With the advantage that you can also use, for example, the signal processing or the neural network toolbox, depending on what you plan to do you are just coding MATLAB scripts. And maybe the easiest and most flexible one to start is the Simulink environment, where you can build Simulink block diagrams. So this little block here is representing, for example, the amplifier. It's reading the data into Simulink. And then you can add other blocks for storing the data in MATLAB format. You can add parameter estimation blocks but you can also use all the standard blocks of Simulink, so you can quite flexibly and fast design your environment. And we provide also drivers for LabVIEW and Linux. This is not another amplifier that we finished recently. It's a 256 channel device, which is especially important for ECOG recordings, where you are using larger grids to pick up the activity. So here's one from AdTech with 864 electrodes in this case, and the inter electrode distance is one centimeter. I can also pass it around. And recently, many people are working on micro ECOG recordings where the electrodes are closer together. And this yields, of course, to a high demand of many channels, and therefore, you can also stack these devices to record up to 1,000 channels. We built also a small head stage uh, telemetry system consisting of a battery shown here and the wireless module shown here with the antenna on top. This here is an electrical stimulator where you can do deep brain stimulation. This here is the head stage amplifier itself, in this case for four channels. So the head stage amplifier itself has a dimension of 29 times 60 millimeter and weights 2.6 grams. The telemetry unit is 4 grams, the sti stimulator 4 grams, the accumulator 4 grams. So this gives you a total of 15 grams that you have to put onto the head of the head. So I can also pass it around. This is the small head stage amplifier that we used for the spike recordings with the aggregation board. You can also have a look. So the unit includes a 12-bit ADC 
and each sampling each channel is 15 kilohertz. So in this case, we use only 12 bit because 24 bit converters need a lot of energy, which is not possible to have it on such a small board. We have a bandpass between 1 hertz and 8 kilohertz. This is a standard setting for spike recordings. Input sensitivity is plus minus 2 millivolt. So spikes have approximately an amplitude of 100 microvolts. It works for two hours and it's using 2.4 gigahertz technology for transmitting the data. And we need only 10% of the power of traditional Bluetooth devices, which is important so that you have a longer recording time and it's six times times faster than Bluetooth. So if we compare shortly EEG recordings with ECOG recordings, so if you record EEG, you use normally between 1 and 64 channels, or sometimes up to 128 channels. And the signal amplitudes are normally around 50 to so 60 microvolts. And the frequency range is from DC up to 40 hertz, more or less. The biggest disadvantage is the low signal to noise ratio but it gives you a very high uh, temporal resolution. That's a big advantage of EEG. If we look at ECOG recordings, we see here in the X-ray image, the electrode grid with red dots. So here you see the electrode grid is under the duodomatum. This is this white screen that you can see here. The wires are coming out. And ECOG amplitudes are about 10 times larger than EEG amplitudes. Therefore, they are much easier to record. You have also the advantage that you don't have muscle artifacts or eye movement in the ECOG recording. And the frequency goes up to 200 hertz or even higher, so you can very nicely record gamma activity. And beside the high uh, temporal resolution, you get also a very high spatial resolution with ECOG recordings. So here you see an image of the head. On top is the scalp, where we normally place the EEG electrodes, and you have some soft tissue, the scalp, the duodomata, and below you can place the eco grid, for example. And the distance from here to the eco grid is about one inch, which is quite amazing. So if you think about your brain, it's much smaller than you would guess from your head. Um, here, this trace is a normal ECOG recording that we have for about one second. It shows some alpha activity and we, if we calculate the power spectral density of it, we see here the power spectrum and we find a peak around 10 hertz, indicating the, the alpha activity. And if you perform, for example, a motor movement imagination and this alpha activity is decreasing and you see also this decrease in the red line of the power spectrum. So basically you find the same changes like in the EEG data, also in the ECOG data, and you can use it for a brain computer interface. A big advantage of the EEG is that we know where we should place the EEG electrodes. If I'm moving, for example, my right hand, I know my left hemisphere is activated and therefore I'm placing the electrodes around the electrode position C3. So this is normalized and everybody knows it. For ECOG recordings, it's much more difficult because you're placing your ECOG grid somewhere under the plane where the doctor needs it. And then first you have to find out which electrode is activated for which task. So you have to do some brain mapping <coughs> beforehand to find the electrode that's important. So in this case, we have a, a real movement. And you see that about two, three, four electrodes are lighting up. And if you you imagine the movement, you see that basically the same regions are lighting up for the ECOG and the EEG. So this is a big advantage for both. You, you first can find the important electrode positions with real movements, and later on you can switch to imaginations for the PCI system. Here you can see how good the spatial resolution of ECOG is. We have, for example, one patient here who is moving his right hand. And one single electrode is coding this information. Another patient is here, for example, moving the tongue, and the single electrode is coding the information. This patient is saying move. And interestingly, for another patient, the move command is also very close to that. 